Um, so we were basically uh, asked to visit uh, with you all on kind of under the concept of digging into soil health. We're really focusing on kind of those principles. Uh, but um, what we decided to do, both, both Barry and I uh, have worked in this area for some time. And uh, we thought maybe the best thing we could offer uh, you is I would spend a little bit more time into kind of what the scientific literature shows. It kind of gives us the evidence. Uh, that gives us that level of confidence we need in some of these uh, principles and practices and that Barry would really kind of focus in a little bit more on the on boots on the ground practice implementation. And so that's that's what you're going to get and I hope that that works okay well for you, works well for you. So to kind of set the stage, current situation, one of them is that we now have the warmest temperatures on the earth that has been uh, in recorded history. Uh, this just goes back to 1880, uh, really showing you since about 1980 that we have the, the warmest temperatures on Earth as in the last two or three decades and have been ever recorded since that period. But I'll tell you that you can go back to ice core data, tree ring data, coral reef data over a thousand years and the same is true. Our temperatures on the Earth for the last one, two decades are the warmest that's ever been recorded over that 1,000 year period also. <coughs> Now, this, we realize that there's a little snafu here. The video is not running on this, but it's very clear uh, from data from NASA and NOAA that the ice sheet in the Arctic area has been significantly shrinking. It's now about a half the size of land mass, what it was uh, just since 1980. And I'm sorry that that video is not working with this version of, of PowerPoint that's on here. Now, what, that means a lot of different things. One, of course, is that when you increase temperature, we got to know what that means to evapor evaporative demand, evaporation, so then what that's going to do to our demand for water and how we're going to influence wildlife and things like that, you know, because we want to grow food with that water too. But there's another aspect that I want to make sure folks are aware of. Am I the only one in the room that thinks that we are having more extreme weather events these days from drought to heavy precip probably not is what i'm guessing is those warmer temperatures there's there's the fact is, is that warmer air also holds more moisture so even when you can have periods of drought when it does rain it can rain like crazy because you have that warmer air now that it is holding more moisture and this is really kind of shown here by this data from NOAA and EPA so again since about 1980 when we had that significant increase you know in, in, in temperature that uh, we are experiencing more extreme one day precipitation events heavy precipitation um, since that period of time so now what does that mean towards being able to protect our soil is no till just enough anymore you know it's, it gets into those those types of questions it's also been projected just by the middle of this century for that 30 year period from 20 um, 36 to 2065 I believe it is that significant parts of the United States according to these model predictions are going to experience at least 18 additional months of drought um, for those significant parts of the United States and this is just at really kind of modest greenhouse gas emission scenarios if you do not curb emissions if you if they keep on uh, going up then this becomes even more dramatic so of course you have to think what's that going to do to our ability to, to feed the population and, and, and all these things now this I have I could show you about four slides as thick as this one uh, that also point out what we're doing to our soils so we've got a number of different years on the left the next column over um, it's, this is a, just kind of a way of classifying soils if these those terms are unusual to you don't sweat it the the information here that I wanted to point out is the difference in the organic carbon in the soil in the uncultivated condition of that same soil compared to the cultivated condition and of course this organic carbon that's the way we measure organic matter the mat organic matter you know what imparts the, the dark color to our soil the most accurate way of measuring that is actually is organic carbon. So that's what I'm using here. And this tells you that all of these science, scientists have published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature that have repeatedly shown declines in the organic carbon in our soil uh, through cultivation. 
And again, this is one slide out of four, this thick, this dense, that I could show you with those same type of relationships that have been documented in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. <clears throat> now, Barry is gonna go into a little bit more detail, but our, our opportunity here is addressing some of these challenges through the principles of soil health. And these are principles of soil health that USDA NRCS has, uh, has developed, has you know, tried, tested, and they've been testing true. And, and regardless of different cropping systems, climatic zones, soils, in many conditions, if you follow these four principles, that they are finding that you can work with producers and, uh, and producers can follow these principles to design their production systems, their tillage practices or lack thereof, uh, to improve their soil health. So he'll be getting to, into more detail on these, but I, I wanted to acknowledge them here because these, that's, that's the title of our session, is these principles of soil health. And um, one of them, keeping the soil covered as much as possible, disturbing the soil as little as possible, keeping plants growing throughout the year, and maximizing plant and animal species diversity. So one of the key soil health practices, obviously, to do that is no-till. And part of kind of the, uh, the, the magic of no-till is by leaving that residue on the surface, not only are you protecting the soil from that raindrop, you know, splash, that impact that breaks the soil apart, but over time, that plant material, the, the, the leaves, the stems, you know, the residues of that plant material, they decompose. It's a process we call humification. It's actually when that plant material becomes part of the soil humus. That's where the humification word, word comes from. It gets to a point where you can no longer distinguish that these were leaves and stems and stalks. They're actually, you know, incorporated now into that soil, part of that, part of that soil humus. And so again, peer-reviewed scientific literature has showed us through applying no-till, we can increase that carbon again in the soil. We can restore it. So again, here's all these different studies, Alabama, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Nebraska, different periods of time, different depths, 20 to 30 centimeters, which is like, what, six to nine inches, something like that. Um, different soils, again, don't worry about what those are, but compare these, the conventional tillage and no tillage, the organic carbon in the soil. Increase, 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 increase. Again, all of these in, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, and I think I've amassed about 21 of these studies, and like 18 or 19 of them show this. Two or three of them do not. Uh, there are some of those situations where it hasn't worked as well, but I would, on the law of averages, I would take that bet. And so, of course, this is kind of comes through the magic of photosynthesis. You know, the plants, they, they use the sunlight uh, as their energy source, and when they also take up carbon dioxide, and then they use that energy um, to convert that carbon dioxide into these carbohydrates as for, their, um, for their energy, the plant energy. Then when those leaves and stems fall to the surface, now you are bringing carbon, carbon out of the air, from that was CO2, now back to your soil. So you hear the term soil or carbon sequestration quite a bit. That's really what we're talking about. And, but it's kind of talking about managing it so that you do have that net increase in your soil. You will still blow some carbon off. It will still go into the atmosphere. The microbes that feed on that plant material, they will still respire the carbon dioxide to the air. But on net balance, our goal is using these practices to increase the carbon in the soil. So this is one of the reasons why it's extremely important. Look at this relationship between organic carbon in the soil versus the water content in the soil. This gray area here is called available water holding capacity. You can see that those lines are not parallel, they diverge. So the more that you increase your carbon, then the more you're going to increase your available water holding capacity. By our estimates, when you increase organic carbon just by 1%, you increase the soil's capacity to hold water by anywhere from 2,500 to 12,000 gallons per acre in just the top six inches alone. Now, I'm really careful to point out to farmers and ranchers, this does not make it rain. <laughs> but, but what it does do is it helps your plants and your soil make the most of what rain it receives. 
Okay, so it's not a foolproof drought resilience mechanism, but it's pretty dad burn good because you know you get a lot of other benefits from that carbon too. All right, I heard someone this morning talk about you know think of yourself as a plant root. Uh, I think it was in the farmer panel that one of them said that, mm -hmm. and I would challenge you to also think what this means here. When you increase your organic carbon in soil, if you are a plant root. Look how your density goes down. This is over a thousand data points that's published in the literature. What does that mean now if you are that plant root? Now you can travel through that soil easier. Now you can mine that soil for moisture, for nutrients. Now you have more aeration. It's not as dense, so you get better oxygen to the root and to the whole plant. So another key practice for soil health, you know, that relates obviously to those, those principles of keeping the soil covered, disturbing it as little as possible, is using things like cover crops. You all know what they are. I, I don't need to define them for you, but it's very clear when you have things like, you know, increased temperature like we just saw, you know, that's happening, increased evaporation, these things, the cover crops, the residue will help keep the soil more cool, more moist. Um, help keep the microbial activity, you know, stimulated. And there are, of course, some of these that can be used that can help control certain soil-borne disease pathogens. Some of them can be used to really help build up disease suppression uh, in your soils. Now, that is a research area that needs more work, and that's one of the things we're trying to work on at the Soil Health Institute, but it has been documented. Through rotations and cover crops, you can do that. And the USDA SARE, the Conservation Technology Information Center, and more recently the uh, American Seed Trade Association have been conducting surveys uh, looking at differences in yield with and without cover crops. The most dramatic differences were shown back in 2012 when we had that historic drought. Uh, but for every year of that survey, they have been showing yield increases of following cover crops. But again, most dramatically shown uh, when they had that drought. Now, here's uh, kind of an interesting situation. Again, we're talking about building resilience, increased temperature, all, all the things that's going on. We have heavy precipitation. Hopefully the lighting is sufficient in here that you all can see on the, the field on the left of that fence line that's in no-till, there's no standing water. Whereas the field on the right, there is standing water. <laughs> there's some sediment, there's some standing water. Uh, I, and they, that's been plowed. Now, I also have to admit that I did not take this picture. I got this from someone else. I'm neither tall enough nor brave enough to straddle a barbed wire fence. But, but what, what is really happening here is the, the plant material on the surface, it is providing kind of that armor, protecting the soil from the splash of those raindrops. That's one thing it's doing. But also when that organic material, you know, break down, breaks down and it builds up the organic matter in the soil, then you build aggregates. That, what that means is the individual sand, silt, and clay particles bind together. You can kind of think of it as little clumps, right? Now when you do that, then you get more water infiltration. It doesn't erode as well, or as easily, I should say. And so, uh, so that, that's one of the things that, that's going there on, on the left side. But then on the right, now the raindrops, the soil's not protected. So the raindrops are hitting those aggregates, <coughs> excuse me, breaking them down to those individual sand, silt, and clay particles. Now they settle out. So now you formed a crust. So now you don't have as good uh, opportunity for water infiltration. And so what this means is that the field on the right, they're missing that opportunity here to recharge their soil with moisture. So they're not gonna have as much now available to them uh, when they need it at that next dry period. And of course, it can also lead to runoff, loss of nutrients, all those types of things, and, and get us all in trouble. <clears throat> but also, I wanna point out that it's not just kind of pictures being in the right place at the right time. Again, the scientific literature really backs this up. Now, I've got a couple of slides that are kind of thick on data, but I'm, I'm gonna kind of step us through it. Different locations, Kansas, Maryland, Malawi, different years, here where they had a no-till winter wheat sorghum system, and when they added a cover crop, they increased the rate of water infiltration into that soil by 182%. So when more water is infiltrating into that soil, well, that means less is running off. 
So you not only are you recharging that soil, but now you're not losing the soil, you're not losing the nutrients that you've, that you've paid, paid for in your fertilizer bill. Second study here, down in, in Maryland, no-till corn, when they added cover crops, it ranged from 160 to 460 percent increase in the rate that water infiltrated in that soil. You can read the numbers, 132 to 194, 165. And so you can imagine that there are also tremendous water quality benefits of some of these same soil health promoting practices and these principles uh, that will help get you there. And when I say practices, I sometimes I use that word too much because really what we're talking about here is systems. You heard from our farmer panel this morning, they are managing systems. They're looking at it from a holistic perspective. And that's what we do too. What we are often faced with is that when we do research, we often have to control a lot of variables in order to figure out what's going on with this one. And so that usually means we're controlling a bunch of other practices and just altering one practice. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm showing you kind of data on practices. But the reality is, is that when you put it on the ground, when the farmer rancher works with it, it's really in work, it's important for us when working with those individuals that we are thinking of the entire system. Just an example, you got a legume cover crop. Well, you don't want to keep putting on the same amount of nitrogen fertilizer, right? It's all part of the system. So your nutrient management system needs to account for that legume cover crop, just as an example. <clears throat> okay, water quality. This is obviously what we want to avoid. So now, look at water flowing in this cover crop field. And I'm gonna zoom right in on here Hopefully you can see it in the light. You can, hopefully you can see how clear that water is. But again, it's not just pictures. It's what research has showed us repeatedly in at least in those scientific studies. Now this one is really thick and I'm not gonna go through them all. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you that. Let's take the top one. In Alabama, they had conventional tillage cotton with no cover crop. They were losing 1,997 pounds of soil per acre per year. A ton of soil every acre for every year. Here's nitrate losses, phosphorus losses. But then when they convert that conventional tillage cotton to no-till cotton, still no cover crop, now they've reduced soil loss down to about half. Similar with, with nitrate loss. Now when they take that no-till cotton and add a winter wheat cover crop to it, now, they're only losing about 10% of the soil <laughs> that they were losing uh, before. Again, still reduced nitrate losses and, and phosphorus losses. And you can, you can kind of go on down the road here uh, of, these, of these other studies. Here, I'll just take another one in Missouri. These are all no-till. No-till soybean with, with no cover crop, they were losing still 1,333 pounds of uh, per acre per year of soil. But then they had tried three different cover crops. It almost didn't matter which one that they used, they got real significant reductions, again, down to about 10% of, of what they initially uh, were using, were losing, I should say. So, pictures tell a story in the real world, but also the scientific data back it up, that these principles are effective. These practices and systems are effective. Same with Use, losing your nitrogen through nitrate leaching. So now we're talk, not talking about running off the surface, now we're talking about draining down through the soil profile. Again, all these different studies, California, Delaware, France, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Kentucky, Maryland, Min uh, Michigan, Minnesota. Several different cover crops, most of them rye, but a, a few different ones. They reduced nitrate leaching losses by anywhere from 65 to 70%, 30, 63, 61. You can see 94. Again, all of these are in the scientific peer-reviewed study where the scientists have reviewed the methods that they used, have re reviewed the way that they analyzed the data, have reviewed the way that they interpreted that data, and they say, yeah, this is all valid. And so there is this scientific kind of level of confidence uh, that can really accompany uh, these types of practices to achieve some of these results. There was one particular study that conducted what's called a meta-analysis of uh, 69 different studies, and uh, he or she, I don't know which one it was because I didn't recognize the author's uh, last name, um, determined that on average, 
Cover crops reduce nitrate leaching losses by 70%. So it's course that your fertilizer bill of course that is you know recycling nutrients back to the surface uh, available for your next crop but that's also quite frankly to help keep regulation uh, off the farm so I'm almost through um, I want to uh, just kind of uh, in, in a couple more slides here to share with you that a lot of these uh, practices are have uh, been very adequately documented in the in the research you know area and um, <clears throat> and I've made a point here of highlighting those but I also think it's extremely important that we are not complacent that we don't that we just don't assume we've already got the answers to everything because the reality is is there's so much more that we can do just for example at the Soil Health Institute, well, we have an action plan. It's like a strategic plan where we've identified all the gaps in research, measurements, economics, communications, education, and policy. Not all of them, a, a hefty amount of like 38 page document. And, but then also identified specific steps to address those gaps, like the gaps in research and adoption. And so just kind of for example, think of how useful it could be do, to a farmer or rancher if they had a tool where they could sit at their computer and look at different like rotations or tillage practices in order to achieve a targeted level of increase in water holding capacity and therefore a targeted level of resilience to drought. My experience is that farmers are some of the best risk managers that they are. And so even if there was no federal dollars for providing that incentive, you know, to uh, adopt these practices, I can see plenty of farmers that would adopt them as a risk management tool. And so uh, that's one of the things, just one of many things that, that we have in there. We're also looking at uh, exploring the relationships between soil health and human health. We're looking at economics, not just in terms of a potential profitability of these systems, but also the level of uh, economic risk reduction that we think can be attributed uh, and tier from these soil health promoting practices. And so, and, and I wanna, wanna just make a point of telling you that, that we are also not an academic institution, the Soil Health Institute, because even in that example, yeah, we have steps where as a scientist, we need to do these things, we need to quantify, for example, these reductions in economic risk, but then we don't stop there. Then we develop the fact sheets, the materials, of four farmers and then we we uh, ground truth them with farmers do these make sense to you and your your cropping system your climatic zone your soil and then once we get that validated by you know farmer uh, a range of farmers then we mass produce it then we get it out the door you know to our folks our our, our partners on the ground like with NRCS ag retailers um, the soil and water conservation districts uh, the list goes on and on and so you know that's again kind of some of these things are still in, in plans but we're, we are working on them now so I just kind of wanted to use this opportunity to also um, kind of make the case that that although this research and the data that I show you tells me yeah we can have confidence in some of these basic practices and systems for soil health we cannot get complacent. We really need to use this opportunity when there's so much of interest in soil health uh, to make the most of the opportunity to develop these next generation tools and this level of knowledge and information on economics, et cetera, that are gonna continue driving. We just, we wanna get this train going down the tracks that nobody's gonna dare get in the way and try to stop it. Because it's the right train, man, the right one. So I would invite all of you uh, to uh, please go on to uh, the Soil Health Institute website. You can sign up uh, to um, uh, receive like our quarterly newsletters, kind of staying you know, um, in track of what we got going on. Uh, occasionally we're fortunate enough, like we are, you heard announced this morning, occasionally we're fortunate enough to be in a position uh, to be able to have funding come in. That is funding that's not for the Institute. Uh, we are funded already by the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation out of Oklahoma. So we can get almost every penny uh, back out the door uh, to address a lot of these issues that are in the action plan. 
And, um, but it's through a lot of partnerships uh, that we also achieve this. I, I mentioned like with NRCS, ag retailers, uh, cooperative extension. Um, in this case, the particular project, the Nature Conservancy, so a partnership that's funded by national corn growers. And the list kind of just, you know, goes, goes on and on. But I would invite you to, to check that out. Don't worry, we will not be sending you an email every day or anything like that. It's kind of like a, kind of like a quarterly um, a newsletter that we send out. And, and you can, you know, ping us in, in different ways. So thank you very much for your attention.